welcome to your Sheboygan County Historical Society's Museum for our Sheboygan Goes to War, the home front during World War II. I'm Travis Gross, the Executive Director here at the museum, and I'd like to uh, invite you along on the story of the home front in Sheboygan. I'm Al Herwig. I'm 92 years old. I started work when I was 16 years old at the Polar Work Company. I worked there for 47 years and they took me into the service and I was over on Guam and I took my my training in Camp Perry, Virginia. We went through the St. Marie uh, Sioux Canal over to Hawaii and then over to Guam and I didn't realize how close I was to Japan until I got home and I looked at a map and uh, I repaired gray marine engines on the LSTs. Oh, and on the LST, I also surfboard behind an LST on a door from a, a cabin that was laying in the junk. And then uh, on Guam, when there was a, an evasion, here was uh, the sh one of the, the ships that uh, had, uh, it was like an army tank. I, it isn't exactly the right name for it, but it had a, a track on it like a tank did, but it floated because on shore there was coral and there was deep ditches in the coral. You couldn't even walk out, you'd cut your knee up to your knees and it, they delivered the men on shore with these tractors or amphibious, I, we call it a tank, but it, it was called something else. And uh, then I have a picture of Guam. Here's a picture of Guam before they bombed it because the ships had us shelled the, the island because the Japan was on the island and they had to shell it for, I'm going to say, a week or two. And then after they were all done, when I came on the island, this is how it looked. There wasn't a house standing. And the Guanmanians, they all went up into the hills to get away from the shelling. It was just hell. And I had heard a story that Japan said the Americans were so bad, they would rape you and uh, kill you and all of the women, what I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but they said that the women jumped off the cliffs with their children uh, just to get away from the Americans. It's a horrible story, but that's what I had heard. Okay. And on the on Guam, we had a a submarine from uh, Japan. This was the bow of the submarine. It had three airplanes aboard. One was in like a cooker almost, like you would have on your stove a big cover that was bolted tight, they'd have to unbolt it and swing it open and get the airplane out. There was two airplanes below and uh, they'd bring it on on the rail and set up the plane and fold out the wings and then they'd bolt the pontoons on it and in the deck was a, a crane. Over here you can see the crane standing up after the plane would come back, it would have to land in the water and then it'd bring it back on the rail and put it back on the ship again. I was told that they had wanted to bowl, bomb uh, the Suez Canal to stop the shipping from coming over, slowing it down, and just to let the Americans know that they could fight, but they'd never got that far. The Americans had gotten the ship. I have literature that my daughter had looked up 
and now uh, tells all the whole story about it. When I came back from the war, we went, it was after the war was over with, we came through this, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the day after, this was in the newspaper, that they found a torpedo on the beach. So we don't know if it was meant for our ship, but we don't think it would have been there that, that long that somebody wouldn't have seen it. Because there was a lot of fishermen always all, all over. And of course, I had a lot of pictures of pinups. I was only 18 years old. Oh, when I when I was on Guam, I had my girlfriend's picture along, and I found a piece of leather, and with the leather I took a nail and I I carved pictures on it. On the back side, I have a girl, and I'm dreaming about her, and a palm tree. The thing looks kind of crude, but it lasted all these years. Over here, I had made souvenir handkerchiefs of Guam, and I traded fellas for other pictures. If you look over on the cover on that side, there's the atomic bomb. Should I pick it up or? All right. This uh, I did with a writing paper. I took a razor blade and cut out. Each color had a different paper that I stenciled something like a, I used like a cotton ball or felt because I had no paint brushes or nothing. And these other ones were supposed to represent Tokyo Rose. Tokyo Rose was on the, on the radio program from the Japanese, and they'd, they'd pick up scuttlebutt about people and their kids, and they'd uh, say, like, Johnny, your girlfriend is going out with a different fella, and just to knock our spirits down. There's a whole story about her. She just was on the radio programs. Everybody in the Pacific would hear her because she played our kind of music. And uh, every day we had a, a newspaper and there was pictures of our lives on in the service like there were, there were ones where um, you'd go to the mess hall and you'd pick up a dish and it just came out of the steam and you'd have to, and the guy says, hurry up, your food is ready and you'd have to try to hold it and get your food on it because there are people behind you. So these are all memories of different things. On the, and uh, these are, are in here. I have this collection of pictures from all over the the country where the wars were, the Pacific, and uh, in uh, Germany, and Europe, and it uh, I collected that from ships that came in, and I'd I'd ask them for uh, uh, eggs. They maybe were old, but not as old as our eggs were on Guam. And I made a, I went to the motor vehicle department and asked them for a piece of wire. I wrapped it around a pencil and I made a hot plate. I would dug in the garden, got some clay out of it, and I put the wire in there and then I plugged it into the light socket and I took a peach can where peaches came in and I fried eggs in there. And I was the hit of the, of the camp. And uh, we also 
Did I show you the one where I was surfing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you showed that one. Uh, we'd save our beer and we'd go out surfing and, and uh, trying out the LST where we re repaired the engines and had a little party then right away. <laughs> so that's, I can't think of anything else. Oh, on the way back, every day, just about every day we met a mind floating, ones with the prongs out, and every time we'd see a mind, we'd circle it for about a half a mile, well, big circle around it anyhow, and we shot at it, and sometimes it would take a half an hour before we'd hit one of the prongs, because the mind was floating up and down, the ship was twisting and turning, and uh, we met one, like I said, it seemed like every day, then I wondered what we missed during the night when we couldn't see. Yeah. And uh, that was sort of scary in a sense. So when I got home, I said, we're going to get married. Life is too short. And we were married 70 some years. So, And I went with her since eighth grade. I am David Martini. I am a resident of Keel. I used to live in Sheboygan for over 30 years. Uh, I actually started my military career when I was in high school. My senior year in high school, I uh, enlisted in the Army Reserve. So while the other kids were playing football and stuff, I was going to the reserve meetings over in Fond du Lac. Well, I went into active duty shortly after that. I was uh, originally in a railroad battalion, and I ended up in the combat engineers. While in the combat engineers, I was in uh, Missouri, Georgia, I TDY'd in the Philippines, and Turkey. I did a little bit of time in Mexico also. Um, I got out of the actual active duty army, went into the Air Force Reserves for a short while. I had medical problems and I was eventually discharged. So after I got discharged, I was looking for something to do and I got involved in the Civil Air Patrol, which is a home front type uh, unit. And I was one of the men responsible for reorganizing the Sheboygan unit. The Sheboygan unit, or the Civil Air Patrol actually started uh, I want to say around 42, uh, Civil Air Patrol itself started December 1st, 1941, six days prior to Pearl Harbor. Well, the unit, the Sheboygan had a unit and it, it, it ran continuously until I guess the early 70s and it pretty much died out. Uh, in the uh, mid 90s, I was approached by a man trying to restart the unit, uh, Gary Thalen, and I was approached you know, to get involved with it, and I did. I was in the unit for 10 years, and I ended up eventually becoming the unit commander. I was also the historian for the state of Wisconsin for the Wisconsin wing of the Civil Air Patrol. As historian, my job was to uh, preserve and display artifacts from the Air Force and the Civil Air Patrol related to our state. I also uh, kept histories of key personnel in the state. And now I've been retired out of CAP for about 10 years. You know, I just don't have, um, getting, getting slow and tired, I guess. Um, but I collect stuff now, and part of my hobbies is I like collecting military memorabilia, and I have a fondness for World War II, and most of the stuff you see on these displays here is World War II. On the end here is an actual U.S. Army footlocker, and the foot locker was where you kept all your stuff. Your whole life was basically in this box when you were stationed at a base. Um, when you were going from a uh, base to another base, you would have a duffel bag. It was a big canvas bag, probably three feet long. You had most of your gear in there. And then you might have a grip, uh, like a little suitcase. We used to call them grips back in the service. Well, then you got to your unit, you would have your foot locker. And, uh, we can talk about things in the Foot Locker. Uh, this is actually set up as a museum type display. It's not set up like a real Foot Locker would be. A real Foot Locker is actually a order the way it was laid out and displayed. This is set up just for people to see things. And this particular Foot Locker is a WAC Foot Locker, which is the Women's Army Corps. My wife was part of that, but she's not here today. This, was, this is her stuff. And she did photography and stuff. This is why you see the, the WAC book here. And she's got some cameras and things in here. And uh, that's you know, all the WAC stuff. Okay, 
When I was actually on duty, I would have a sidearm. My sidearm was a 45 Colt. This is a replica for obvious reasons. Um, but that was my sidearm, and you carried your sidearm with you all the time. Okay, um, this is the kind of thing you could buy, like when I was in the Philippines, you could buy this in the base exchange. You put your cigarettes in here, it's like a little hut that the natives would have lived in. And you could put your cigarettes in the hut, and this was your ashtray right here. You know, they sold all this kind of stuff, and all these guys brought this stuff home. Okay, this is the kind of telephone you would have had on your desk back then. And this isn't unique to the Army. This is just a style of telephone that everybody had back in the day. You would dial it, you know. And most of the time, you'd end up going through an operator to switchboard. And then the operator would connect you to wherever you wanted to go. This here is a serving tray. It's enameled steel. These were put out for fundraisers, uh, like a war bond drives and things. So you could actually buy these or be awarded these for selling so many war bonds and things. Over here is the typewriter. This was pretty much the standard typewriter I would have used back in the day. You know, I was in the headquarters company most of the time. I've been the standard typewriter I would have actually used. And that's a portable. You can fold up the case and take it with you. Uh, down, from the phono uh, down from the typewriter is a phonograph. That is an actual U.S. Army phonograph. I restored that. Um, it was in beat up condition when I got it. I totally restored it. It is totally functional. Um, later on, we can play it, if you guys want to hear it play. But back over here is a, field de uh, a clerk box or field desk. You can see the Coca-Cola bottle, my pipe tobacco, my pipe. That would have been all my office stuff I would have kept in there, my paperwork and you know, stuff to pertaining you know, to the office work. Over here are standard uh, posters of the time. The, this, this poster here would have been in a school because you're buying, you're buying uh, war st saving stamps and so many stamps would be worth a bond. So this would have been in a school. The one on the end down there for a secure future, it says buy war bonds, that would have been aimed at the adults. And that particular poster, you notice the ruralness, the guy's got a tractor, a barn, that was aimed at the Midwest here, Wisconsin and stuff, aiming at the rural type people. In the middle here is, you say, see it says build and fight in the Navy Seabees, join or voluntary induction or enlistment, apply to your nearest Navy recruiting station. You may also volunteer for service with the Army engineers. See your nearest Army recruiting station. The thing about the Navy Seabees and the Army Engineers, you could actually enlist up to age 50 if you had a trade, such as a carpenter, bricklayer, or cat operator, or crane operator, whatever, you were wanted. You know, so you could enlist. And of course, everybody knows about the Glenn Miller Band, which was probably the most famous band at a time period. This particular poster is post-war. Glenn Miller was killed in 44, I believe, when his plane went down in the English Channel. Uh, after, after Glenn Miller disappeared, Tex Beneke took over the band and then Ray, uh, Ray McKinley. So I'm thinking this is probably mid-50s. But Glenn Miller stuff is impossible to find. Anything original Glenn Miller you know, is impossible to find other than records. The records are everywhere. But posters and things are impossible to find. Up on the wall over here, there are four uniforms. The one closest to Dave was my wife's uniform. She was the finance officer for the Sheboygan uh, wing of the, Sil the Sheboygan squadron, the Silver Air Patrol. The next uniform is mine, Majors. I was the commander of the unit. I was also the wing historian for the state of Wisconsin. The uniform next to it is our field uniform. And if you can, if you can zero in on that orange patch on the pocket, the bird dogs, that is the original patch from World War II of the Sheboygan unit. I found one of the members that had one, and he allowed us to, to borrow it, and I made, I had a embroidery shop make copies of them, but that patch was pretty much lost to history. But after I found the one, we had patches made so that patch survived. The only difference between the original World War II patch and the new one, the original World War II patch said Sheboygan. No one said Sheboygan County. 
and we're thinking we're not sure, but we're thinking Walt Disney may have designed that. Walt Disney designed a lot of the patches and things for the Army Air Corps and the Civil Air Patrol and stuff, but we're not sure on that. Hi, uh, here we are today at our event talking about the uh, prisoner of war that were kept in Sheboygan County towards the end of World War II. Uh, we did have two locations in our county that did house German uh, POWs. Uh, one was Camp Sheboygan here. Um, here's a nice photo of some of the prisoners that were at the old uh, 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 insane asylum that was located um, on the property that now is Valrath Company's warehouses, the Sheboygan Police Department back in that area. Um, they were housed there in 1945 for one year. Uh, there was a little over 200 uh, that were uh, were housed there. So the asylum was vac vacant at that point and they uh, decided that they could use it for this purpose. Um, so they were sent, U.S. troops were sent with some uh, supplies to build a fence around the property um, and, and then they brought in the, the POWs who then went about cleaning up the hospital so they had places to stay. Um, they were the ones who got the beds back in place, the furniture back in place, did some minor repairs so the windows didn't leak as badly, things like that. Uh, Camp Sheboygan was pretty unique because they did keep them there for one full year, so they were there over the winter. Uh, Camp Plymouth, on the other hand, most people will remember that that was at the county fairgrounds in, in Plymouth. Uh, so the troops that were housed there actually was two years, 44 and 1945. Uh, they primarily used the 4-H building that I believe believe is still out on the grounds that was the bunkhouses uh, for the tr for the POWs the American troops who were there uh, to guard them like this gentleman here they were the ones who stayed in the tents so kind of this uh, idea the sense that the prisoners had the better structures and the guards the Americans were the ones who housed in the tents um, so in the winter time they took them out but then again in the spring they uh, brought the troops back to the uh, uh, Plymouth fairgrounds. Uh, Plymouth was an interesting place. Uh, they both actually had a lot of the local people uh, come and visit with the prisoners at these camps primarily because at that time in the 1940s Wisconsin's population was about a third of German ancestry. So there's a commonality, there was a, fami a familiarity with, with these prisoners. Uh, so you had uh, community members that would go to these prisons and have conversations through the fences or share some German baked goods like Stellen and, 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 and items like that. Um, it got to a point where these prisoners probably felt like they were back home in Germany, uh, that they were treated so well. These, these four, I love this photo because these are prisoners of war, and what we see here on their, on their uh, pant legs are the markings, the PW for prisoner of war. Now this photo is so great because look at how happy they are. Uh, look at how healthy they look. And these are prisoners. They had their mascot dog. I'm not sure the story where that is, if it was a stray they just took in. But I mean, they certainly don't look like prisoners of war. Uh, that's how well uh, they were treated here in the United States. Uh, there were tens of thousands of Germans that were brought here to the United States. Fort McCoy in western Wisconsin was one of the hubs in the Midwest that they first went to initially. And then from there, they were partitioned out to uh, other uh, locations. Uh, some of the old CCC camps in northern Wisconsin were used for, for uh, uh, the, the prisoners. Um, old buildings such as the asylum around the state were used as um, uh, camps as well. So uh, again, it was a very short time, but uh, one of the population, in, uh, population of people in our county that really benefited from the, the prisoners were the farmers. Because the prisoners were allowed to leave the camps during the day and they went to work out in the farm fields doing harvesting and they especially went to work in the area canning companies so just about every community back in the 40s had a cannery and these prisoners would work side by side with citizens of the county uh, doing the work in the cannery canning food uh, for the stores so a very unique situation when you think about and you and you hear the stories of how American POWs were treated in Germany or especially over in the Pacific theater uh, a, a complete 
night and day comparison of how we treated the Germans here. Um, the Germans came here because towards the end of the war, 44, 45, uh, England was primarily the place that most German POWs were going to in the war, and German, uh, excuse me, England's camps were filling up with, with prisoners. So they made a deal with the United States. The United States would start taking some of the prisoners overseas. So shipped over to the East Coast. From the East Coast, they were put on trains to numerous different camps and forts around the country and from there they were uh, divided up into smaller uh, camps such as this a couple hundred few hundred people at, at each location uh, so here's a, a photo um, I believe this was taken at the Plymouth um, Railroad Station of the German POWs uh, lined up having just arrived here in Plymouth before they were sent off to the uh, uh, county fairgrounds they marched they walked them from the train depot in Plymouth to the camp. Um, so they walked right down the street. People in Plymouth came out to see them. And uh, I don't want to use the word parade, but it had that kind of atmosphere to it. Um, people came and watched them come into town. Uh, a personal story um, with one of these, and I found it truly fascinating. A Robert Lorenz told the story of when he was a young boy back in 1945, and they were sitting down for a uh, family supper and a military vehicle pulled up outside their house and two soldiers with a man between them uh, came up the sidewalk to the front door. Uh, the doorbell rang, his father went to answer, Robert's father went to answer the door and Robert remembers as a small boy that whoever this person was spoke with his, his father for a few minutes in German. Uh, Robert, not knowing German, didn't know what they were saying. Uh, but it turned out that this person was a POW from the camp in Sheboygan and he had caught wind from one of the local women who would come to the camp to speak with the prisoners and whatnot that there was a person of the exact same name uh, living a few doors down from her. So they went and investigated and in fact it was Robert Lorenz's uncle, his father's brother. Uh, Robert's father had immigrated to Canada from uh, Germany right before World War II started and from there he made his way down to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. So Robert's father hadn't seen any of his family members in over 10 years at this point uh, and the only family member that Robert had met from uh, his father family was this uncle and and he didn't really meet him he saw him at the door saw him have a short conversation with his father and that was it never to see him again um, it, stories like that uh, you know it's just unbelievable and how welcoming it was and the fact that these prisoners were allowed to leave the camps um, albeit he was guarded but to go work in the fields what what is keeping these German soldiers here harvesting what's keeping them from just running off into the hills there was nothing, there were a few guards, but they could have most definitely done it. But they realized that surprisingly, even though they were prisoners, they had it pretty well. They were out, they were working, they were making money. Um, a lot of them stayed here. They did. They were yep. Yeah. So after the yeah after the war, they had uh, come. Uh, they were sent back to Germany. But after everything settled down with their responsibilities and whatnot over in Germany, a lot of them moved back to the states and Wisconsin, especially. Mm -hmm. I'm Marge Madden, a member of the museum for a very long time, and we brought a few items here for you to look at, and we hope you'll be interested. History is dying if you don't keep it going, I'm telling you, especially the young folk. What I brought here, I think I'd like to show you, is uh, a paper that we use to write letters. It was called V-Mail. I believe V stands for victory. And it opens up like so. And here's where you write your letter and tell your boyfriend how much you missed him and you wish he'd be back and blah, blah, blah. We could write what we wanted to, but there's a picture here that Emma will talk about. That's how it looks when they wrote the letter. And when you're finished writing, you fold it back like this, and there's a crease here. You fold that like so, and then you put the address on there where your sweetheart might be, and he might get this a month or so later, and then he will open it up, 
and if there's room here, he'll write back, and then this is what it looks like with the mail that he gets, and we'll have Emma talk about that. That's her book here. We're going to talk a little bit more about your other Oh, and this little... That used to be a t-shirt. <laughs> But as the years went by, the cotton wore out, and I tossed it, and I thought, I'm going to save this. And that's what this is. We can do it. And that refers to ladies like Emma and myself who worked at the core factory, and we worked in the piston. Pardon me? I will. And we worked in the uh, piston ring department. And that's when we sort of found out that men thought they knew everything. But I'm here to tell you they don't. We, uh, the people on the uh, machines would stand there and put the piston ring in their slot, press their foot down, and the machine would go around like that. Then they would take that piston ring out and fill up the carton. And then I would come along as chief inspector and I would pull some of those rings out and look at them. I wish I had a micrometer to show you how we gauge the width of that ring. If it had burrs on it yet, we did what the workers hated. We'd say, you have to do these all over again. And that's why if you want friends, don't be an inspector. But that's what I did for a couple of years. And then when the war was slowing down, we didn't have to make so many piston rings anymore. These all went to the Allied Air Force. Then they shifted us over to another department, which was no longer war required, but they wanted to keep us busy. So they put us in the um, brass department. And you can keep that department, because we lit out of there shortly. But that's a little bit of the history of what we did at Kohler. And Emma did the same thing. You're on. You want me to talk about it? When You're I on. Okay, the same thing. We first of all did the, there were boxes that came with stacks of, of these um, brown looking piston rings. Mm -hmm. And we inspected them and like Marge said, we threw out it those that. Eight inch, I think. Eight inches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, anything that looked bad, we, they were culls. We didn't use those. And then later on, somebody asked me if I'd like to be an inspector in the next department where those that passed the first test, they were taken over to the lab, uh, micro lab, what did they call it? Hyperlab, the hyperlab, those are big machines, and there was room for five discs to be put in there, and that's where they were finished. And like Marge also said about a micrometer, I had to inspect everyone, not each one, but every once in a while you'd pick one out, and again, you'd throw out those that weren't any good. But I worked there and that uh, in for Kohler for maybe about a year, and then I I used to ride the bus, no, the streetcar, from Michigan Avenue. Out, I don't know where it stopped in Kohler, but then when um, after I was tired of that, I went to the Garden Toy Company where I could walk from home just a few blocks away, and there they made first aid kits, and um, my job was to um, take the basic kit to the uh, uh, department where it was sprayed with a dark green color and then I moved it out and then later on they put a decal on it to mention that it was a safe uh, um, first aid kit. And then there was also another line where they made the, um, the framework, well it was about a this inch big framework in which later on bomb fins were put into these crates. And I was a relief girl there. When somebody had a break for 10 minutes, I'd take the, their place and come back to the next. And then after a while, I thought I'd like to go back to stenographic work. Because I had been in Washington, D.C. When I first graduated from high school, there were seven of us decided we'd like to go to Washington, D.C. because civil service was looking for women because the men were all in, into the service by that time. And so we had all taken the commercial course in high school, shorthand, typing, all of that. And um, I uh, 
we passed the t I passed my test in August, but I couldn't leave until I was 18. They didn't allow you until 18. So I finally got there in October, and by that time, some of the other girls had already arrived, and they lived, they found a li house to live in where, well, the pictures are awfully small, but we lived there in a house on the northwest side of, of town called Carolina Place. And we would ride the trolley downtown, and from there we would transfer to a uh, bus, and then we would get across Key Bridge to Arlington, Virginia, and that's where I worked for the um, Marine headquarters in the, uh, what was it called? Anyhow, I had to do a lot of typing, and in those days when you typed, you had to make three extra copies. You had carbon paper, which was just a black sheet of paper, between each one, and if you made an error, you had to lift that up and correct it, all of them, and they all, these four copies all went to different departments. And about a year after that, some of the girls decided they would go on, move on to California, one went to Alaska, and some of us decided to come back to Sheboygan, including me. My um, twin brother had already, was already in the Navy, and my younger brother was planning on being in the Marines. So I thought I should be home with, take care of my help, take care of my parents, we're a little old, elderly. So I did that. And then I um, decided I would like to go back to office work again, and I got a job at the Eden Writer Lumber Company in the lumber office, and my future husband, we graduated from high school in the same, at the same time, but we never knew each other in high school. And he worked in the other department, in the woodworking department, and that's how we met and eventually married. So when I was in Washington, we used to buy a, a pass that we could use for, for either the um, streetcar or the trolley, and it cost a dollar twenty-five cents for a week. And that's all it was necessary, and you could get wherever you wanted to get in Washington. So it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of good times. One time at Christmas time, our landlady's daughter, who was in high school, told us, oh, she had heard we could cut down our own Christmas tree if we had like. We didn't know it, but it was a national forest. And here I was given the hatchet. <laughs> and I was in the middle of cutting down the one we had picked out. And all of a sudden, a squad car came along and two officers, well, what are you girls doing? Well, we heard we could get free Christmas trees out, so well, how are you going to get it home? Well, we had never thought about that. <laughs> so, lo and behold, they took it home for us, and we decorated, and we had a very nice Christmas. <laughs> but I want to mention one more thing when we left Kohler. We had to go talk to the big honchos way over in the office of it there, tell them why we want to leave. You couldn't leave. Germany had surrendered in May, but we couldn't leave because the war still wasn't over. So I, we had to talk to them personally and ask them, and he asked us where we were going and why we're going. Will we be doing post-war work over there? Oh, absolutely, you know. So we moved out east for about a year. That was the history of working at Kohler. What did you do out east? We worked for the H.C. Penny Company, and I might add that it was a submarine base. And we girls thought we had to add to the war effort, right? There was 5,000 sailors there. Now that's a place to go. Tell them about that. Well, they were they were all in the war yet. No, yeah, but I mean that he was in the merchant marine. Yeah. So we were over there for about a year, and. Um, we saw, uh, just before Japan surrendered, we had to go back home. So we're gone less than a year, but at least that quarter work was very, very difficult and we were happy as hell to get out of there. But I just want to mention that we had to get permission. Can you imagine that? Well, I had to get permission to leave Washington too. And sure. I said, no, I'm leaving because I've got a month vacation due, and I've got uh, sick days, and it had accumulated enough. A month vacation? Where'd you get, where's there? For, 
for that when you work for civil service, you have benefits. Ooh. I don't know what I earned in those days, but... Probably 20 cents an hour, maybe. I know the, the foreign got 90 cents an hour. And we thought, wow, that must be a big payday. One of the other things that was very interesting, during the war, our church, Trinity Downtown in Sheboygan, put out a newsletter for our servicemen. Every month they'd get a newsletter. And um, I brought two of them along. In one of the issues, in the January issue of 1945, Mr. Alfred Young from the Alfred Young Clothing Company, he thought it'd be a good idea to have a picture taken of the church on Christmas Eve of the school children always had their program then. And so he hired a photographer to come and take a picture and it was included in the next issue, which the guys all really liked because they had gone to school there. And this was the staff that put out the newsletter. There were different positions. I was an inquiring reporter. Whenever we'd see any of our servicemen downtown or at church, we would talk to them, write a little bit about them in the newsletter. Just interesting facts, not anything secret or anything like that. And um, so Mr. Young also thought it was nice that we had a staff who was willing to do that. There were, I think, about 18 of us. And they, he had a banquet for us at the Grand Hotel at that time. It was a different so, world. Yeah, so, and that pretty well sums up I what, what I did. Emma, I wish we had ration books here. Yeah. Have all of you young people heard of ration books? You didn't get a lot of sugar. Candy was hard to find. If you wanted a nice chocolate candy bar, you got in line when you heard chocolate was in. And you got in line, and then when they waited on you, you could buy that one big candy bar. Wasn't it, wasn't it shoes were rationed too? I thought oh. shoes. I thought you were limited to buy two or three pair a year, that's all. Well, that's, that's all we bought anyway, Emma. Well, I know, but some people like shoes more than we did. We had, <laughs> we had shoes for the workday, and we had shoes for Sunday. We had two pairs of shoes. Hi. I'm Earl, and this is my wife, Charmaine Knievers. We both lived during the Second World War with our families, and we had a lot of things that were important to be done, and one was really the expansion of the gardens, the Victory Gardens, and what that meant in addition to the normal gardens that most families had in those days, generally we found a place where we could grow more things. And my dad bought, I shouldn't say bought, he rented a plot of land north of Sheboygan, which was good farmland. However, there was one major problem with it. And the major problem was, it was the great guy up there that controls rain. Sometimes it rained adequately and sometimes it didn't. And there was no faucet available for water. So can you imagine little guys with a bicycle here and a gallon of water here and here trying to pedal out to the gardens? My wife also had a lot to do and she'll tell you about their victory garden now. Charmaine. Hello. Well, I'm happy to be here today, and um, it's a good thing for the younger folks to learn all about the home front during, uh, during the, the 40s, during we, the war years. I grew up in Kohler, and my parents had a victory garden, and in fact there's a picture of my mother right here with some of the produce. It's from August 1941, and this photograph was taken right across the street from which is uh, uh, the upper upper road in Kohler across from the cemetery where they had the victory gardens. There were also some victory gardens where the, the streetcar um, no longer ran and they, they took out the tracks. And so I remember weeding the garden. It was never my favorite thing to do, but the vegetables were fresh and delicious and uh, it was a 
good time of life and um, I think that's all that I really remember about Victory Gardens except that everybody had a Victory Garden. So we're happy to be here today and we wish the best to everybody. Good afternoon, my name is Henry Young. I have been a member of the Sheboygan County Historical Society for over 20 years and retired within the last year from being the program director for the third Saturday programs, which in looking back over the years, we've done 10, 11 straight years of programs every Saturday, third Saturday. You'll notice a change now where we're uh, moving on to more programs outside of the museum or other things, but we're happy to be here. I am in proud to have three of my publications here. One, the Sheboygan Press, that's in a color page, and two, Chicago, Chicago Tribunes from 19... whatever the year the war ended. 45. 45, May 7th, I believe. We're happy to be part of this, be invited to be part of this program today. We have a lot of pictures here, articles that have been brought either from the research center or from our homes personally, and we like to share it with our audience. I know that about an hour ago our attendance was just a little over 125, so we're happy that we had a nice turnout for today's gathering. I'm proud always to be able to help the museum wherever I can, either on the Financial Development Committee or the Third Saturday Committee, and uh, it was tough to me for, to say goodbye, but it's fun to come back as a so-called veteran and share my knowledge and share one of the programs that we're experiencing today. We've had several guests that have stopped and have talked about their war years and not many from World War II because they'd be close to 100 now or high 80s, 90s, but uh, we're happy to display our our wares here with the audience that are coming by today. Logan? My name is Logan Beenan and I've been a member of the museum and the third Saturday committee for about six years and this was by way of invita invitation from Henry Young who asked me some years ago whether I would like to join and I, I said yes. Um, the only newspaper here that I saved, and I was 12 years old when World War II ended, was this one, the one in the red headline. And uh, obviously it caught my eye and I put it away. I have many other newspapers, but they're all subsequent to this particular great event. Uh, the um, uh, Sheboygan Press was quite a different publication in those days. Uh, Charlie Broughton, uh, Mr. Charlie Broughton was the editor of the Sheboygan Press. And those of you who know Sheboygan know that Broughton Drive along the lakefront in Sheboygan was named after him. Uh, as is the Sheboygan Marsh. And the Marsh as well. So I enjoy being here too. I enjoy history. I've always loved history. Even though I was a teacher of language arts at a local high school, South High School. And history's always been one of my passions as well. This particular book uh, is available in the Mead Library. It is uh, on the home front in Sheboygan and it's full of things that pertain to Sheboygan for World War II, what it was like. And my recollections are quite sharp because even though I was only 12 when the war ended, it was the topic of the day. People talked every day about the war and it was very often on the, almost always on the front page and very often in the headlines as you can see. So. Um, it, uh, it, it was something I remember quite well, and uh, I, I, uh, I, I treasure the papers I have, although I have a couple dozen more papers, they all are about events that followed after the end of World War II. So I'm, I'm happy to be here, I enjoy this kind of thing, and I'm glad to give back to my community. I'd like to add a couple comments 
of my personal recollections when I was, Logan and I are the same day, went to the same high school, Central High School in Sheboygan. But there were things I remember from World War II, such as when there was a USO club uh, in the old Rex Theater in Sheboygan, people that had their victory gardens. My father had a little sticker on his car with a, either a letter A or a B or a C, designating what type of... I think that was A was four gallons a week. I think four gallons, yeah. If you had an A sticker, you were close to heaven. Uh, and I remember when they sold in the grade school, uh, every Friday, I think it was, they would sell saving stamps. Ten cents, little stamps, you put them in a book, and when you had $18.50 worth of stamps, you could get a bond. And within ten years, that $18.50 was worth $25. Although many people didn't hold on to the bonds that long, you were allowed to cash them in, and most of us did.